Richard Dawkins, who is a professed atheist, wrote in his book, The God Delusion, that people are predisposed psychologically to religion. And that's why we have all the religions of the world that we do. And Christians often will hear the Karl Marx statement in college, or they'll read Richard Dawkins, and they'll say, well, what are we supposed to say about that? Let me say both of those men are exactly right. Every human being has been created by God with a God-shaped vacuum in their heart and soul. And so is religion the opiate of the masses? Yes, we need to worship something. And what history has proven, what psychology has proven, and what Hollywood has proven is that we will worship something, anything. It doesn't matter. We'll make our own stars up and we'll call them stars and we'll worship them. We'll create our own idols and vote for them on telephone because we need an idol in our life. We need religion. And Dawkins is right. We're, we're predisposed for this. God created us this way. Now, do I believe either of those men are, are right on anything else? No, but they are right in the fact that we have a God-shaped vacuum inside of us. And this is the way it's always been since the fall of man in the garden. And this is the way it's going to be in the end when the Antichrist is on the world scene. One of the ways, and we've already discussed this in Revelation 13, but one of the key ways that the Antichrist is going to control the world is through religion. Religion is powerful. Men have known this. Um, there's an old movie with Denzel Washington called The Book of Eli. And I don't know if you ever saw this movie. I don't like to recommend movies because then when you go back and watch them, they're filthy and they're trashy. And you thought, I did not see that on the ABC Sunday night special. But um, when you rent it, nothing's edited out. And it, but in this movie, it's very interesting. Um, this madman is controlling what's left of humanity through religion and he's searching for one particular book because he knows its power to control people. The book that he's searching for is the Bible and he can't find it. Uh, there's there's got to be one out there and this is the premise of the whole movie but even that movie recognizes the power of religion in people's lives. The Antichrist is going to use religion He's going to have his own false prophet that is going to help him control the masses of the world. So if you've ever wondered how will he be able to control all of the governments and the people, he'll be reaching their heart through false religion. So what's going to happen to the false religion that's always existed? And what's going to happen to the false religion in the days of the Antichrist? Well, that's what Revelation 17 exposes. So we are going to look at what God is going to do, how he's going to deal with this false religion. So number one, what I want you to see tonight as we come to Revelation 17 is the deception of false religion. The deception of false religion. Now, false religion is extremely deceptive. There are people in cults that many of you know of and you're aware of, and these people in cults have been extremely deceived in their life. There are people in other world religions that will give their lives for what they think is truth. And that world religion, which is anti-truth, is very deceptive. If you ever doubt the power of deception that these world religions have on people, just go back to 9-11 in our country. And if you wonder, well, why did these men board an airplane and slam the plane into the World Trade Center? The answer is because they believed that this was their means of getting into paradise according to the religion they believed in. It was a very religious act of worship. And so it's very deceptive, and that deception has real implications that play out on the world scene. Letter A, what I want you to see from Revelation 17, and we're looking particularly now at verses 1 through 6, God views the deception as problematic. He views the deception as problematic. So if you would ever say, why does God not deal with all this false religion? He is going to deal with it. He is going to deal with it. And in the end, he's going to finally 
deal a blow to it to where it will no longer be a problem for anyone. He views it as a problem. And we see that evidently here in chapter 17, Revelation 17 and 18. Now, when we get to 17 and 18, I want to explain this. Technically, chronologically, these are inserts. Chapter 17 and chapter 18 are a parenthesis in the chronological order of the book of Revelation. I'll say this again next week when we get to chapter 18. But technically speaking, you get to Revelation 16 and you get to the very end of the chapter and the last bold judgment is poured out. We chronologically should go straight to chapter 19 and we should pick up chronologically with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're wondering where does chapter 17 and 18 fit? Because we just finished with Armageddon the last time we studied Revelation. Wouldn't Armageddon be the end? Wouldn't there be nothing left after Armageddon? Correct. So technically it goes chronologically from chapter 16 to 19. This is a parenthesis. What God is showing you in chapter 17 and 18 is exactly what he plans to judge that was part of the Antichrist kingdom. There's two things that God is going to judge specifically. He's going to show you the object of his wrath, the object of what deceived millions and millions of people during the Antichrist reign. The one thing is false religion. The other thing is the economic world, worldliness that is evident as well. Chapter 18. Tonight we're looking at the world religion that's so deceptive. So it's been so deceptive and it will be deceptive in the end. Now letter B, God views the deception as a plague. Okay, it's not trite to him, it's very serious. He views it as a plague. The false religions of the world are actually one major deceptive initiative fueled by demonic deception. The false religion is called the great prostitute here in Revelation 17. And her influence has been literally everywhere. The scripture says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. That's verses 1 and 2. Israel's relationship with God was always viewed as marriage, and her falling away was always viewed as adultery. So false religion has always been considered in Scripture as sexual, immoral adultery. And that's the exact wordage that's being used here in Revelation 17 verses 1 and 2. The same can be said of kings and people who have turned to this great prostitute's charming deception. So, so what I'm trying to get you to see is that this great prostitute will be present during the tribulation period and will lead many people astray then and God will deal with her then but the great prostitute has been leading people astray for centuries, millennia. If you look right now in our world there are ten major world religions. Now what I find in church is people confuse three things. They confuse cults with world religions and they confuse the occult with world religions. So if that's you, let me just kind of help you out here for just a moment. A world religion is something large. It has masses of humanity falling under it, okay? So for example, Islam is a world religion. Christianity is a world religion. Judaism, Taoism, Hinduism, Buddhism, animism, world religions. There are millions of followers under the umbrella of that particular religion. There's only about 10 in the world. Now, under those big world religions, there are all kinds of different branches. So just like in Christianity, you have Catholicism and Presbyterian and Assembly of God and Baptist. You have the same thing in the other world religions. In Islam, you have the Sunnis and the Shiites and all kinds of other groups that would identify themselves as Muslim. 
You have the very same thing in Buddhism. You have the same thing in Hinduism. There, there doesn't ever seem to be uniformity across the board in any one of them. But within each world religion, and this is what gets confusing, there's cults. Now, a cult is anything that doesn't teach the orthodox teaching of that religion. So you can have the cult of Islam. You say, what's the cult of Islam? Louis Farrakhan, Malcolm X, the nation of Islam. That was a cult of Islam. You follow me? You can have cults in Christianity. What is a cult in Christianity? Mormonism. Mormonism is a cult. Why? Why would you say that, Pastor Mark? Mitt Romney was a good guy, and so were the Osmonds. Maybe so. But the reason why we would call Mormonism a cult is because it does not teach orthodox Christianity. We would say the same thing uh, about Jehovah's Witnesses, and the list could go on and on. And so you have cults. And a cult is anything in a world religion that does not adhere to orthodox teaching. And then finally, you have the occult, which is Satanism, which is completely different. And so in the occult, you have everything from demonic uh, worship to the Church of Satan. You even have witches and warlocks, and I'm sure Harry Potter's somewhere in there. And so with all of it, you have the occult, all right? So think about world religions, cults, and occults, and you have enough to give you an understanding of why God literally views false religion is problematic and as a plague. Why he calls it the great harlot? Because people prostitute themselves and they love this great prostitute and she has deceived people from the beginning of time and will continue to deceive people. Do not think that during the great tribulation period there will be no religion. Worship will be at an all-time high. People will be more spiritual during the Great Tribulation period than they've probably ever been. Now, don't mistake what I'm saying. I'm not saying churches that preach the truth of Jesus Christ will be full. They'll probably be closed. But spiritualism will be huge. There will be people who are spiritual, who are at one with God, whoever she is. And those kind of things will be rampant. They'll be blaspheming the name of the one true God who is God the Father. But religion's going to be rampant during the tribulation. People are going to run to spirituality because of all the plagues and all the earthquakes and all the damage and all the destruction. They're going to need something to hold them together. And so as one friend used to say to me, Fred Sharon, he'd say, there's money in religion, and there is money in religion. You can see there's a lot of con artists today who are millionaires and billionaires using religion and using people, and it'll be the same way at the end of time. Religion will be big business. Now, Jesus won't be big business. Religion will be big business. Don't we already see this happening? I mean, don't we already see people are so spiritual, Right? They're going to these churches that will affirm lifestyles. They're denying the authority of Scripture. They're, they're deconstructing their faith. They're rewriting. Well, I don't believe that's what the Bible says. And I don't believe that you have to think that Jesus is the only way to heaven. But I'll tell you what is huge. Spirituality. Spirituality. I have a friend who deconstructed his faith. And he said, I'm not going to spend my time reading a book written thousands of years ago by a bunch of men, I'm finding God again. And this time I'm finding Him on my own terms, and I'm connecting with Him spiritually, whoever or whatever that is. And that's big business today. It's huge. It's the religion of Oprah. It's the religion of Joel Osteen. It's the religion that we see that is making huge inroads and this is getting us ready for exactly what Revelation 17 says will be judged by God and will be used by the Antichrist. Letter C, under number one, these false religions have always been present. 
So even though it's real in the days of the tribulation, it has always been present. We've, we've been told that this woman, the prostitute, has enticed the world, and she's called Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, the earth's abominations. Now, all you have to do to understand why she's called Babylon is go back to Genesis chapter 11. Now, we don't have time to do that, so let me just talk really fast, all right? Let me be Steve Canfield for about five minutes. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 11 in our minds. And, and what do we remember happened in Genesis 11? It was the Tower of Babel. So this is after the flood. And remember that in Genesis we read about a man who was Noah's great-grandson. And his name was Nimrod. What a name. Nimrod. It's like something you'd bully a kid with. Hey, Nimrod. And he was named Nimrod. And the Bible says that he was a mighty warrior before the Lord. And what Nimrod did was he created a kingdom of warriors conquerors and they decided to build a tower on the plain now i've said this before i once heard on a radio broadcast someone downing the story of the tower of babel and they said how ridiculous this must be because if if this was real god should have just let them build their tower and when they got so high in the air they would have suffocated because the oxygen would have become thin and so they never were a threat to God, yet the Bible says they were trying to make a tower to heaven. Well, that's a misunderstanding of the wording there in that text. First of all, they were not trying to make a tower to get to heaven. If they were, they would have built on a mountain, but the Bible says they built on a plain. That means they went to the lowest point, okay? They started there. The next thing the Bible tells us is that it was a tower or a ziggurat is what it's called. Now, what we learn from historians and archaeologists is that the ziggurat started here at the Tower of Babel. The tower itself was a pole, a ziggurat, a tower of worship. And what it means when it says it reached into the heavens is it means that on the very top of that tower was a zodiac symbol. So ziggurats would be long, huge towers going up into the sky with a zodiac symbol on the top. And so astrology, not astronomy, those are two different things. Astronomy, you learn at Ole Miss. Astrology, you learn at Ole Miss. No, I'm just kidding. Who knows? Who knows? You know, but, uh, but, but astrology is this idea of like Gemini, Sagittarius, you know, Cancer, um, on and on it goes. And, and this astrology was the idea that these priests could look to the stars and from the stars they could gain spiritual insight and wisdom and some kind of divination. Now this is exactly what was happening in Genesis 11. This is why God confused their language. Not because he was trying to, to, to stop them from getting to him. That's ridiculous. We don't even know where heaven is. And they're, they're technically in space is no up. I mean, you go up in space, but then when you get up in space, what's up? I mean, is, you go this way, this way. It's not, it's not two-dimensional in space. It's three, maybe four. And so we have, we have no concept of up and down there. All we know is that God is in the heavens, and he's even above the heavens, that what we would call space. So it's ridiculous for anybody to think that they were building a tower to reach him. That's not what they were doing. They were building a tower to worship demonically using the stars. Now, when God confused the language, they were spread out. And when they were spread out, they went all over the world taking their occult astrology with them to numerous other civilizations. And what you start finding from that point forward after Genesis 11 is these ziggurats, these worship poles, these towers began to appear in other cultures and other civilizations. So Babylon was the first place of all false religion. And what we see in Revelation 17 is that there will be a city Babylon again. I believe it will be a literal city where the Antichrist dwells. Babylon today is destroyed. It doesn't exist, but it's right at the point of rivers. It's at the point of three continents. It's the perfect location for strategy. 
And I believe that it will be rebuilt again and from there, false religion will once again flourish and people will do what they've always done since the Tower of Babel. They will look everywhere else except for God. What's amazing is the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God sent His, his Son to reveal Himself to us. So that we would know God, we would know Him, we wouldn't be confused, we wouldn't have to search the stars. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and yet, man doesn't want to listen to the Word. Never wants to listen to the Word. Man wants to look to astrology, man wants to look to cultism, man wants to look to the occult. Give me answers. Let me read a tarot card or have my fortune said. Let me go to darkness to try to find truth. And this is the present darkness of false religion that has always been present. And it started in Babylon. It will return in Babylon in the end. Let's look at number two. Not only the deception of false religion, but let's look at the danger of false religion. So... You say, well, well, what's the big deal if these people believe all these things and, and it's not true? You know, it sounds arrogant for you to say that we are the ones with the truth. But I want to tell you that there is a, an, an inerrant danger in all false religion. Letter A, false religion, first of all, always brings persecution. Always brings, brings persecution. Now, we're going to be looking primarily now at verses 6 through 14. But people are not only deceived by such false truth, but it often leads to death. False religion has been Satan's means to persecute God's people. And if you just look at verse 6, you see the proof of this. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now again, John is seeing a vision. This is a parenthesis. God is showing him what God is going to judge and why. John, caught up in this vision, sees this prostitute. It's not literal, it's a vision. The prostitute represents the false religions of the world, and in that prostitute, she is drunk on the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Christ. Not of all religions, but of Jesus himself. And false religion brings persecution. It always has. How many Christians have been persecuted in Muslim countries? How many Christians have been persecuted in communist countries? Over and over again, there's persecution. Letter B, false religion brings false peace. It brings false peace. It always has, it always will. People during the tribulation will endure such horrors that they'll turn to this false religion for comfort. And the great prostitute a false religion is described as seated by many waters. So there in Revelation 1, chapter 17 and chapter 17, verse 15, what does it mean that she's seated by many waters? It means that she's always in a place of prominence. If you look at most cities of the world, what are they built by? Water, right? They're either on a coast or they're on a river, or they're on a lake. So most major cities of the world are always built on water. The only exception to that rule that I know of, now I'm sure there's others, I'm sure there's some buck snort, you know, Mississippi or Tennessee that's not built on a river. There is a buck snort Tennessee, I know. But I'm sure there's some place like that. But the only major city in the world that's not built on water is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Like when you go there, you're going to say, what's so special about this city? Well, it's, it's spiritual. I mean, that's the only answer. There's no, there's no physical reason for this city to exist. What is Memphis built on? The river. It's strategic. What, what was Vicksburg Vic built on? And, and why was it a major, major turning point in the, the war between the states? The river. I mean, water is always so critical to everything with life. And to call this false prostitute somebody who sits on many waters, it means that she's in every city, she's in every country, she's infiltrated every place, and people have always looked to her for peace. And needing peace, in the end, people are going to look to her again. 
but it only brings more enslavement. It does not bring peace. False religion only brings enslavement. Christ is the only one that brings true and lasting peace. Let her see, false religion brings spiritual problems. Spiritual problems. What false spirituality has actually brought to humanity is greater sin that leads to greater despair. Notice what the prostitute has in her golden cup. So there in chapter 17, verse 4, we read that in the golden cup that she holds, symbolically, the golden cup that she holds, are abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And so what she's always really brought was problems. And finally, letter D, false religion brings, creates hardness against God. Hardness against God. Notice the prostitute of false religion is figuratively described as sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. That's Revelation 17, verse 3. Now, the beast is the Antichrist. And again, as we've already said, the Antichrist and the prostitute will merge together to accomplish Satan's goals of world domination. But the word scarlet is always a color in Scripture for sin. And so the beast is the Antichrist full of sin, and false religion has always been supported by Satan. And in the end, in Babylon, it will be supported by the Antichrist, and he'll use the innate need of religion to unite his kingdom. The church and the state will be one like never before. It's funny because we think when the end comes, church and state will be separated, but that's, that's not true. Using the word church in a proverbial sense, not in the sense of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, but in the sense of religion, religion and state will come together like never before. It'll be more united than it ever has been in the history of mankind. But what this ironically does is creates hardness. False religion does not point people to Christ and to humility and to the fruit of the Spirit. Instead, what false religion does is it causes people to blaspheme the name of God, to blaspheme the name of God and the person of God. Now, what I'm about to say, I don't have any scientific proof, and I don't know if it's conjecture or silly or what, but have you ever thought, why, why is it when, when people curse, um, you can say in this country alone, but you hear it everywhere, why don't they ever say like, you know, Buddha, dang it. Why do they say God? And, and why do they say Jesus H. Christ? I don't know what the H stands for. I'm sure Texans think Houston. But um, there is no H in his name, all right? But, but why do they say his name? There's a couple of reasons I think so. Because number one, I think if they said it about other world religions, what's the first thing the media would say? Oh, you're being prejudiced, right? You're biased. Oh, that's just bigotry. But yet every movie can say Jesus Christ's name to infinity is a cuss word and nobody flinches. They can say GD to infinity and nobody flinches. Now, try saying Mohammed with an explicative on the end of it and see if you don't lose your head. Just, just do that in their country. I'd love to see that, wouldn't you? Let's get Hollywood to go there and do that there because that would never fly. Now, some of it is Americans are just weak. I mean, we are. If, if we had the determination that the Muslim has for their belief in their false God, then we would stand up and say, absolutely not, you cannot blaspheme the name of my God. But, but what, what really is even deeper there, it's, it's not even really us, it's that the world loves its false religion because it's satanically motivated. And Satan will, will always stand up to Satan. He doesn't cast out Satan. And so they're going to uh, they're going to never down those religions in movies. They're never going to down those religions in acting and all that, but they certainly will Christ. Why? Because I think and believe that he is the true God. 
And that the reason why they're so against him is because he is not from this world. He is not from here. He is from God. And the devil knows that. It creates a hardness against God. All false religion creates a numbness and a hardness against God. Well, let me show you the final thing that we see here in Revelation 17. So, we, we see the deception of false religion. It's always been here. It will be here during the tribulation period, and God will deal with it through judgment. We saw the danger of it. It is dangerous. It's dangerous today, and it will be dangerous then, leading millions astray. But then I want you to see the destruction of false religion. It will be destroyed, and the irony is God will use evil to eat evil. And that is exactly what our text says. If you doubt that, look at chapter 17, verse 15 to 18. And when you read exactly what's going to happen to this prostitute, you look at verse 17, it says, For God has put it into their hearts, who is there, that is the Antichrist and his government, to carry out his purpose, God's purpose, by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. I mean, there in verse 17, everything that's going to happen in the end of false religion when it's judged is ultimately God using it for God's purpose. But I want you to see the destruction of false religion. Letter A, I want you to see that evil only cares for itself. It only cares for itself. In the end times, the rich resources that religion brings... And it's going to bring a lot of rich resources. The reason why the Antichrist is going to want to use religion is exactly what's figuratively described here. In chapter 17, when you read about this this false prostitute, she's described as having scarlet, gold, gold cups. There is money in religion. And the Antichrist is going to use this money for his good and for his gain. But eventually, he will turn on the false prostitute. In the end times, the rich resources that it brings will be used by the Antichrist for Satan's purpose. This is why John says, When I saw her, I marveled greatly because she's arrayed in money, wealth, popularity, and power, and Satan is going to continue to use this to deceive. But letter B, I want you to see this. Evil always turns on itself. It only cares for itself and it always turns on itself so I want you to just see how it turns on itself Satan has no friend Satan is no friend of sinners nor does he care for his own agents and by the way can I just stop and insert right here Uh, this is the way evil works If, if you're into sin and you think that those who sin with you care about you you are wrong. They do not. They will turn on you if it's to their advantage. They will destroy and eat you if that is what's best for them. That's what evil does. Evil doesn't stick together. It doesn't hold together. There is no loyalty with evil. And so many times young people will get into things whether it's gangs or drugs or, or, or wickedness, pornography, lewd things, and they'll think, well, you know, I'm in it with these other people, and I've got them. They will not stay with you. They will end up destroying you. And that has been the case of so many people. So just know evil always turns on itself. It has historically, and it will during the time of Revelation. So the devil only cares for himself. And we see this turn of events in 15 through 18. This is what is described as the ultimate destruction of all false religion. So here's the good news. If you're sick of seeing televangelists milk people out of money, the good news is one day God is going to ultimately bring this all to an end. If you're tired of seeing cults deceive people and lead them astray to death and destruction, the good news is... God is one day going to bring all of this finally to an end. If you're tired of seeing all these world religions where people are deceived, the masses are deceived, then the good news is there will come a day when God will bring this to an end. So, I want you to see how he does it. 
here at the very end of chapter 17. Letter A, ten smaller kings who will help the Antichrist will, with the Antichrist, turn on the false religious system they have used for their purposes. And you see this specifically in verse 16. They will gather together. So the Antichrist is going to rule, but he will have ten smaller kings or vassals or governors who will rule with him to keep control of the system. And so these ten kings will rule together with the Antichrist. They will do his bidding. They will rule on a smaller scale. And at some point during the Great Tribulation, they will finally turn on religion. They'll use religion to get to what they want. They'll unite the world. They'll get all the money that this religion has brought in and and been able to create, all the wealth, and then they'll kill it. Look at letter B. God will put this hatred for religion in their hearts to carry out his purposes. So it's God who's going to do this. He's going to make sure that they actually do his bidding. So when we say that all things work together uh, and God is the one in control, you see this very clearly even here. Letter C. God will even use the evil of the world system to carry out his purposes of judging this evil prostitute that has plagued man since the Tower of Babel. And you see that in verse 17. And I'm not reading these verses. We could, but you can go back. And and by the way, if you're new to this, I always give you this handout. It's very detailed. Um, I don't always read every word of it, but I give you this. I'm just inserting this here, kind of like 17 and 18, parentheses. Um, Because when I was in college... I had a dear man of God who was um, my favorite professor of all time, Dr. Ron Mitchell. He died of pancreatic cancer in 2009. And what he would do in Bible class is he would teach just like this. Now, these are not his notes. These are my notes. But he would do things just like this. And you would come to his class every day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and you would get a packet of notes every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And he would just walk through the notes Now, you were tested on all those notes. You literally had to memorize stacks and stacks of typed notes. But he would do the blank system, and I always loved that. I learned so well from that. But number two, he would say, now this gives you something that you can study later. You see, his positions were so well defined that anytime somebody had a question about his soteriology or his eschatology, there was no question. One time he got called before a board because of what he was teaching at the college. You know, Baptist colleges freak out over things like predestination that's in the Bible. And so, you know, he got called before this board and he said, well, you don't even have to call me here. Everything I have is written out and has been given to everybody that I've ever taught. And so he was exonerated. He was exonerated for whatever charge was brought against him because it was so well put. Now, I'm not worried about that. Uh, But what I am saying to you is I give you these notes. One, because that was the best teacher I think I ever had. Number two, Revelation is a hard book, and you need to study it. I've said this over and over again. I'm not right about everything. I don't claim to be right. You can disagree with me, and we can still be friends. No Baptist will agree on everything. Trust me. Is it church's chicken or Kentucky fried? Neither. I tell you neither. Yea, not I, but the Lord. And so, we're never going to agree on everything. And your position on raptures and millenniums and all those things may be different, and that's okay. But what I want to give you is something that you can go back and read in your own personal time, and you can say, well, you know, he cited Ezekiel 23 right there. Let me go back and read that for myself later. Let me look at what he's saying there. Mm -hmm. He he cited MacArthur there. I don't know if I agree with him, or he cited Criswell. I don't know if I agree with Criswell. But what this will help you do is just to be able to study it for yourself. All right, parentheses over. So, God is going to judge the evil system of the world. And you can see that in verse 17. You can read that for yourself. Letter D, and the very final thing. The great city of Babylon will be the center of this evil. And we see that in verse 18. God will bring the destruction on that which has brought so much destruction on his creation. Now look, here's the good news. If we really believe that Jesus Christ is the answer, then we should be sharing the gospel 
as much as possible. If you really believe that false religion is dangerous and destructive and will be destroyed by God, then the mandate for the church is don't, don't stay quiet when you have the truth. Share the truth of the gospel. Many, many people are deceived today. And they're deceived not just with Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism, but they're deceived with their own sinful heart. And they need the light that Jesus Christ says that he is. The light shines in the darkness and gives us hope, right? And, and let me also say, we should never apologize. And I hope there's none of you in this room, though I'm sure that there probably is one or two, who would shirk that I would say Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. I don't apologize for that. I don't defend that. I speak scripture. You don't like that? Fight God. Wrestle him all night long like Jacob. But in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, not a way. I am the truth, not a truth. I am the life, not a life. Christ is the only way to heaven. Everything else is false religion. You ain't going to take nothing for your journey now because you got to make it to heaven somehow. Honey, you ain't making it nowhere, no way. Jesus is the only way. Amen? That's it? All right. Well, look at there. Hey, hey, throw money instead. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, let's pray. I'm a false prophet, right? I'm like Joel Osteen. Let's, let's close in prayer, all right? Father, thank you for the night that we have together to study Revelation 17. I pray that it motivates us to love you more and be obedient and be witnesses for your name's sake. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. And we all said amen. 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 Thank you all for being here. Enjoyed it. And I was just kidding about the money. Maybe, kind of, sort of.